Emiko, thank you so much for being here. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. yeah. It, it's always so good to have you and, and have conversations because mm-hmm. you have such a unique perspective in the fact that I don't think I've ever met someone who's working with students or overseeing a program students at like 50 different universities. So past few years, it feels like things have changed a lot in higher mm-hmm. education. What have you seen? A conversation I have with every parent I talk to is how high school during COVID and during the pandemic really has made our students struggle a lot when they get to college. Making that transition is hard enough already, but since they never really gained those skills during those years, like their junior, senior, um, even the freshman year, students who had school during the pandemic are now freshmen in college, and they're really struggling with the structure and the expectations, turning in things whenever they they want to, how they just, after COVID, never got back into the flow of things academically and are having a really hard time keeping up with those deadlines, even studying for tests and being able to critically think about the material and apply it during tests has been really difficult for students. Yeah. So when you say those skills, like what are the primary skills? Because obviously a lot got stunted and a lot of it isn't their fault, right? It's just just reality. Mm -hmm. What skills have you seen that actually did get stunted more than anything else? Task initiation. So starting a task that they need to do during the pandemic, they had all day to do it. And now it's, okay, I actually need to get this started to help the rest of my week. So that's something that I've seeing a lot of students struggle with is starting when they actually need to start. They know what they need to do, but the act of starting it has been really difficult. It used to feel like my job was like 25% like getting them started. It feels like 75%. It feels like almost the whole thing now is getting kids started. Mm -hmm. I met with a student. He had a missing assignment for a couple weeks and I thought he was going to need help with the content or what to write for the assignment, but we just sat down and he was just able to do it. And so that accountability was really important. Getting out of your normal living space was really important. We met at a coffee shop and he was just super dialed in and there was a lot of noise around us too. And I was worried about him, but he was like, no, it's helping me focus. And he got it done within like an hour. That's awesome. And you said kind of the two big things that I think are such a great example of what works, accountability and getting out of your living space. Like we all trick ourselves thinking we can work in our dorm room or our apartment. And I don't think I've ever seen a kid pull that off. Mm Mm-mm. Maybe you can finish something in like three hours, but if you go to a coffee shop, it might take you 30 minutes. Or if you go to the library, it might take you 20 minutes. Getting out of your space and into a space where you can really focus and not have the distractions of your kitchen or your bed. That's my biggest distraction is my refrigerator. Just grabbing a snack. But yeah, I think that's something I always preach to my students is get out of your get out of your living space and somewhere that's meant for work. The other thing that you do so good with college students I've seen is like, we all have this time that slips away from us throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Class ends at noon Mm -hmm. and then we have another one at three. Can you kind of walk me through what what you're telling students? It's always a balance of like, take care of yourself and rest after a class, but also use that structured time during your day. I always tell students like, don't go home because you're going to lay in bed for 30 minutes. It might turn into an hour and then you need to get ready for your next class. So I always tell them stay on campus, get food. That's always an important one. So their energy can be sustained throughout the day and they can focus in that late afternoon class, but pick like one or two quick assignments or maybe just use that time to respond to some emails, but being intentional with that time can go a long way. So being intentional with like, I need to go home and rest because I'm exhausted or being intentional with like, I'm going to get stuff done right now, but Don't try to do both at the same time. And I love that advice and finding the structure in there as well, because so often I know with ADHD, it's like six o'clock. I'm mentally done. And I still like two or three hours of homework because I let all these little breaks slip Mm -hmm. away from me. So I've just seen that really transform a lot of students that we've worked with. And it definitely takes practice and experience to be like, wow, I feel so much better now that I can go home and do nothing because I use my time wisely during the day. But sometimes when you're in the moment, you're like, I don't need to do it right now because I'll just do it later. But it does take practice and reps to get in that mindset. Yeah. Just reinforcing the freedom as adults that you get. I know I see you do that all the time where it's just like, look at how much freedom you have because you actually use the time in between classes. Mm -hmm. Let's say a class gets out at noon. Your next one starts at three. How tactically do you do that with students? Do you have them go to the same spot? Do you have them go to office? Like, What does that look like? I think it depends with what's going on and what they're struggling with. Like sometimes students have like a help room that they can go to. So I have a student who's taking chemistry and biology and I just have her go do the homework in the help room 
or she's like really stressed out about our lab report she was telling me about this morning. She's like, I'm just going to go to the help room and do it with them so they can answer my questions, which I thought was great for her to start. So it depends if you have the availability to go talk to a professor then be on campus. But yeah, going to the same spot every day and just having that routine of this is when I go to the library to get X, Y, and Z done before Thursday, like having that routine is really impactful. And once you get the hang of it, again, it takes reps for you to like see that payoff and see your mental clarity be lifted and less stress, but it's definitely worth it. Yeah. And taking the willpower out of it. I'm a believer that a lot of times willpower, you know, we think it's just willpower, but Mm -hmm. surrounding yourself with structure is just so important for getting started. You don't need to work up all this willpower to do it. Mm -hmm. Like it's okay. What I always tell my students is routines help us limit the decisions we need to make throughout the day. So if you're deciding, okay, I have this three hour break in between class, should I go home and chill or should I go to the library and get this stuff done? Most of the times we're going to want to go home and have a break. But yeah, if we have that routine so we don't have to make that decision, it becomes a lot easier and then you don't need the motivation to do it because you're just doing it. There's so much research behind, especially ADHD and decision fatigue. Mm -hmm. Someone like me, like I need all the mental capacity I have to just get through the class. If I'm making all these decisions, it just doesn't work. So Mm -hmm. having those routines, I love that. Mm -hmm. What else have students been struggling with recently? This could be tied back to COVID as well. They never had the chance to get a big project and to chunk it out, break it down into small pieces. So when they get this eight page research paper and they need to find seven sources for it and going through the steps of outlining it, revising it, writing it, like all of those steps I think has been really hard for students and they think they can just sit down and crank it out in three hours, but it takes time and it takes multiple days, even if they're working 30 minutes a day, like that's kind of what you need to do to chip away at a massive project or a paper like that. So I've been seeing that a lot where students just don't know how to break down work and they expect themselves to be able to finish it in one sitting. And of course that would be great if we all could do that, but it's just not how it works. Absolutely, no, just drinking monster energy drinks and just I'll figure it out, right? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't Mm -hmm. work like that. What do you coach families and students to do to avert that crisis? Actually taking the time to like, what's the first step? What's the second step? And listing out those steps is really important. Also being aware of how much time something is going to take you with researching. It can be really easy if you have the right databases available or if you don't have to find outside sources. So kind of just going through the details of each step can feel really tedious and overwhelming in the moment you do it. But then once you're doing it, it's like, thank God I did that prep because it's a lot faster to actually like do the assignment. Yeah. And just getting started early because you're going to mess it up and you have to have mm-hmm. empathy with yourself as a new college student. Just like, I'm probably going to mess a piece of this up. So giving yourself extra time for that. The other thing I heard you recommend too, that I loved is that if the papers do Friday, the projects do Friday, take it to office hours and treat it like it's due Wednesday. Because mm-hmm. the person grading it is the person giving you feedback and that's just like a win for everybody. Yeah. It gives you that extra buffer time for if they tell you like, oh, you're missing X, Y, and Z, or it just gives you the extra motivation to get it done. So we know getting started procrastination and just taking these big overwhelming goals and making them small is something that we're working hard on with students. Mm -hmm. To flip it, we've done a lot of work with professors. I know you have done as well. What is the number one thing you're seeing professors struggle with right now? I think knowing where students are gonna want to find the information. For me, when I am working with students, I'm checking the syllabus, the dashboard, the calendar to find all of those assignments and instructions as well. Some professors aren't thinking how a student thinks. So like students these days don't go to the syllabus to look for instructions, even though that's where most of the time they are. So I think sometimes professors are not thinking like, okay, how is my student going to receive this information and what are they going to do with it? That's like the lead domino for professors, whether it's a syllabus or portal or canvas or whatever that is. If you get that as organized as possible, it's going to save you so much time on the back end. I had a student I was working with this summer and she took two summer classes at the same time for two different sessions. And they're like five week sessions. So they're really fast. Something was due every day. The first session, the professors were super organized, very consistent. Every Friday discussion post was due. Every Sunday to test was due. And that repetition helped her and she got like high A's in both of those classes. And then the second session, super unorganized, not that much detail in the syllabus, kind of turn it in when you when you feel like it. But the papers, 
you have to turn it in on time. And we didn't know that. And it was a lot more stressful of a second session. Unfortunately, her grades reflected that, just the stress and the disorganization. We were always like, we don't really know what's going on or what's expected of her. So she really struggled with that. And it was a shame that she kept saying, like, I wish I had the same professors as last session because I knew what I needed to do. And it was it was just kind of a mess, unfortunately. I think every college student in the country right now is agreeing with what you just said, because you know, we just see it over and over. If you do invest a lot of your time as an educator, you just save a lot of time on the back end. It's a better experience for everybody. Mm-hmm. I know it sounds like a pain in the tail, but we always say, show your portal to the most disorganized person in your life. If they can figure it out, like you're good. I have a student, she has assignments due every Wednesday, which like that consistency is helpful. But one of them's due at 12.59 a.m. and one's due at 12 p.m. So when a student sees that, they're going to think 11.59 p.m. because that's the default. That's what most professors have their assignments do is 11.59 p.m., which is midnight. Mm -hmm. But it was 11.59 a.m., which is just a mess. And I missed it. She missed it. And she turned in an assignment late and got points deducted just because of that small difference. So being consistent, not just in your own class, but with other professors that you know of. And, and, And again, the goal is to teach students the material. We want them mm-hmm. to master the material in your class, not mm-hmm. to be guessing where to find stuff or when to turn stuff in. As a parent, I'm mm-hmm. sure it's very scary to send your kid off to school. If you're the parent of a junior or senior, what can we be doing now to develop these executive function skills and independence? What would you tell them? Exactly what you said, independence. So when they're doing chores or cooking themselves meals, it, it'll be really important that they're taking ownership in some of those responsibilities. So when they get to college, it's not brand new to them. Some students get to college and they don't know how to do their own laundry. I know that sounds crazy, but I've, from my experience, I've met people in college who didn't know how to do laundry. I'm seeing it now. Also prepping meals for themselves, even if they have a dining pass, like knowing which vegetables to eat, how to balance their plate. That's one thing that I think is really easy to implement when you're living under the same roof. So building that independence, just like how to take care of yourself as a human because they're going to be responsible for that when they get to college. As for executive function skills, I think having routine and structure throughout their day is really helpful. And I know when they're in high school and in class for seven, eight hours a day, that's a lot of structure already. But having some routine after school, even if it's just a quick one or a simple one, having them get used to having routine will be really important and helpful because they'll start to recognize how it helps them. It doesn't feel like extra work when they get to college. College is really unstructured. It's like you show up on campus and you have all this free time. There's no one breathing down your neck anymore. We know students who find a way to develop structure, they Mm -hmm. do much better. What can we be doing now as parents of a junior or a senior in high school to help them learn how to develop this structure? Junior, senior year, that's when you start getting like off periods and open campus. So I think a good way to start there is encouraging them to do their homework or like getting an assignment done during their off period or if they have a car and their license knowing what they're going to be doing right after school can be a good start too like I said high school provides a lot of structure already so you need to find where they don't have structure and then encouraging them to use it and again it's being intentional with your time so if they're just getting off of school and they don't know they're going to go home and do homework or if they're going to go over to a friend. Just being intentional and just being aware of your time and how you're using it. It doesn't need to be super strict, like every hour is planned out. But I think that's my big takeaway is just knowing what you're going to be doing next and committing to that. The other hard thing too is having hard conversations with roommates and hard conversations with professors or college staff or whoever. What would you do before they leave for college to start to have these conversations or how would you teach these skills? That's a really good question because I think a lot of college students learn by doing it and I would hope that they don't have a lot of conflict (laughs) in their life. But kind of talking about like how would you feel if your roommate did X or how would you feel if your roommate was doing these things that were making you uncomfortable and kind of talking them through and getting them used to like what they're going to expect. You don't expect to have falling outs with your roommates. You don't expect needing to advocate for yourself. You don't expect those things to happen. So kind of just planting the ideas of like, what would happen? How would you handle the situation? How would you feel about it? And then going from there about having to address it. Teenagers will roll their eyes every time you have this conversation. Right. And so often just simply having the conversation and putting it in their heads, they may not engage with you, but putting it in their heads can be so helpful. Yeah, They don't know what's coming. 
And so they think they're going to step foot on college campus and it's going to be this like perfect situation. It's good for them to have that background knowledge just in case. What about organizational systems? Because how many students have we seen show up on campus and have no organizational system at all? Mm Mm-hmm. What would you start doing now? Um, one thing that's really helped me in my life is having a launch pad, like a launch bowl where walk in, keys go in, wallet goes in. So it's always there when you're out the door. You don't need to spend time finding your keys or your wallet. So that's one thing that I love to implement. Or if they have like a hook that they can put their lanyard on, just get creative with it. And as long as it's by the door and it's consistent and it's easy to maintain, I think that's another thing that's really important is we can get so nitty gritty with how we organize our stuff, but it needs to be easily maintained throughout the year or like when they're having their hardest day, putting keys in a bowl is not that hard. I like how you start easy and I like that's where your head went. How many times have you gotten that call from a student where it's like, I lost my key card for my meals in my dorm room? All the time. (laughs) I don't think as a parent or an outsider, that's something you would realize that that's such a big issue is losing your meal card. The key to your room. Like I went to the bathroom and got locked out. So I had to go to the desk and it took 30 minutes to get into my room. Like that's, those are things that are really easy to do as a college student. I did it all the time. That's such a good piece of advice. My head didn't go there. I don't think most people's did, but it's a huge anxiety provoking thing. It's like, where's, where's my stuff? And so mm-hmm. in high school, having that bowl, like you said, where you just drop your keys and you get used to it, that will transfer. Mm-hmm. What about assignments and to do's? What do you recommend for things like that? I think having any type of visual way to see how your week's going to look or how the semester is going to look is really important. So a couple things that we have found helpful is like month to month calendars, either even a desk calendar or just using an electronic one like Google Calendar to have the big due date. So you can see like, okay, I have three tests this week. I think it gets cluttered when you do every single assignment, but Have like a month to month calendar with all your big assignments, your papers, projects, travel, if you have to go home for like Thanksgiving, but then keeping a weekly list of things you need to do and somewhere where you're going to be checking it often. So a couple of things that I have had students do is either write it out and have a notebook that's always open to you when you're working. I have a student that puts everything in her reminders app and then makes that app a widget on her iPhone. So every single time she opens her iPhone, she is reminded of like, okay, I need to do these three things today, which I thought was a genius way to use our technology. And usually the phone's the distraction, but you, in that case, it's helping her stay focused. And then also just time blocking out your week. We talked a lot about routines and structures, and that's a great visual tool to know When do I have free time? When do I have time to rest? When do I have time to go to the library and get a good chunk of homework done? That's a tool that I think I do with all my students at the beginning of the year. And they're able to see like, okay, that's my library time. This is my go home and rest time. This is when I go on my bike rides or go to the gym. That's like a great visual tool. And then just having it always up in your calendar, being gracious with yourself too. Like it's not going to be perfect every single week, but just having the visual cues is really helpful. College is one of the rare times in life where you get your syllabi on the first day Mm -hmm. and you can like see your whole semester. Of course, things get moved around. But what you said about just getting all that down once you get your your syllabi, like what a great idea Mm -hmm. that is. Tell me more about the time blocking that you do with students because I've seen that work really well. Mm -hmm. So basically, we take their schedule, take their non-negotiables first and put it into a weekly hour by hour block of time. So starting with your non-negotiables, that's going to look like your class meetings, any club meetings you might have and putting those in first. And then from there, kind of filling in the extra space. So like we said, we have a three hour block of time. How are we going to use that time? How are we going to be intentional with it? So get lunch, go library, next class. So students can start seeing where their free time is. One of my students gets out of class at 11 on Tuesdays. And I don't think it really clicked to her. Like I have a lot of time to get a lot of stuff done that day. So I think the visual cue is something that's really important and being able to see your time. I hear a lot too, students are saying like, I don't have enough time to go to the gym. I don't have enough time to go to the grocery store or stuff like that. Or I had to stay up late to do this homework because I had no time during the day. And I guarantee you that's not always the case because they just don't know where their free time is. So starting with the non-negotiables and then filtering it in by your priorities. And don't forget basic needs like sleeping, exercising, getting good meals throughout the day because that's equally as important as going to class. And friend time. 
Like, oh, like, yeah. like college is such a fun time. Uh-huh. Let's give you time for that. There's something about what you do with kids, especially with ADHD and anxiety, where when they see their time, it's like this magical event. They're like, oh, and then they get it. But they need to see it first. They mm-hmm. don't just feel it. Originally, you talked about something that I want to come back to. So not doing your homework in your apartment, dorm room, college house, whatever. Mm-hmm. Can you go deeper on that, please? Yeah, absolutely. So our brain gets used to spaces. When we walk into our bedroom, we see our bed. Our brain is going to be like, okay, this is where we rest. This is where I can truly do nothing. It's not where like, oh yeah, this is where I want to get a lot of work done and I'm going to focus for hours. That's just not what our brain is thinking. So especially when we're in our dorm rooms or we're in a tiny apartment with roommates, it's really important to keep that space for what it was intended for. And that's going to be sleeping and rest and even just like hanging out with friends. Like that's what that space is for. So when you go outside of that space to go work at a coffee shop or go to the library, our brain will start to be like, okay, this is where we're focused. This is where we get a lot of work done. And it helps you get into that moment of actually working and being productive. So yeah, like we said, going to the library for an hour versus working at home for an hour, I would love to see how much we can get done. And I I use this practice a lot because I'm usually working from home. So on a Friday when I don't have a lot of meetings, it's like, okay, I'm going to work on these tasks all day at home, or I'm going to go to a coffee shop and get them done within a few hours. And it just opens up so much free time. Yeah. If you're disciplined enough to use whatever that space is for productivity and productivity Mm -hmm. only, you'll be good. Mm -hmm. And then use your bed for sleeping, rest only, and you'll be good too. All the time we hear from college students, it's like, I can't fall asleep or I can't focus. It's like, they're trying to do everything in one location. Keeping the spaces separate, I think that's just, you know, one of the core pieces that we recommend in in that situation, which I don't think a lot of college students think about. Yeah. It also goes back to the effect the pandemic had on our students because during the pandemic, they were doing their homework and their beds. They couldn't go to a coffee shop. They couldn't go to a library. So they think like, okay, this is where I do homework. So it works. But when you have those spaces available, like you got to use them because it will help you focus so much more. And open up more freedom because again, our goal is to help you have fun in college. A lot of this sounds restrictive. It's the opposite. Yeah. And that's actually another thing that I've been thinking about a lot because we talked about it with routines and time blocking and building out our calendars at the very beginning of the semester, everything we're talking about, it sounds like so much work that we're putting into it and breaking down the assignments, breaking it down each step, getting into the details. But we do that work up front so the rest can be a lot easier. If we don't do that work up front, we're going to struggle along each step. And that's where it gets really hard when we're not really seeing it get easier. So putting that work in front will always be worth it. Thank you for saying that, because there is an anxiety epidemic on college campuses right Mm -hmm. now. And everything we're talking about, it's to decrease anxiety. Mm -hmm. So know very clearly what's expected of us and how do we get from beginning to end and be successful. When you talk about exams, exams are a different beast in college. They can be much more stressful because usually they're a high percent of your grade, you know, Mm -hmm. somewhere up to 30 to 50 percent or more. And a lot of us don't know how to study or prepare for those exams. What would you recommend just as universal advice that you give? A lot of people jump to how to study, which obviously is really important, but I would even take it back further. Like, how are we showing up to class each day? Are we just going there to get clicker participation? Are we actually listening to our professors and taking helpful notes? A lot of my students, if they don't like a professor or they're boring, they're monotone, they end up doing other stuff that's productive during class. But if you're going, like I've challenge them to really be present in that moment and pay attention to what other classmates are asking, pay attention to what the professor is stressing over and over again. Because then when you're at home studying for the test, you'll be going through the slides and trying to remember what's important because you weren't listening in class. So to your best ability, show up and be present in those sessions is going to be the start of it. And then you can each step along the way, like how do we interact with homework? That would be the next step. Are we Googling every question and just copying and pasting what Google's saying? Are we actually like sitting in that uncomfortable moment of not knowing the answer and trying to figure it out in that moment? Because I think a lot of students will be like, I don't know this answer. I'll just Google it and check or something. We'll give them the right answer immediately and they just move on without sitting in that feeling of like, I don't know, like, how am I going to figure this out? And like pulling from all their information. This internal tension, anxiety, uncomfortable you're talking about, Mm -hmm. that's part of the learning process, right? 
Oh, absolutely. In every aspect, um, academics, personal growth, it's those moments where we feel uncomfortable is where we do the most growing and learning. I don't feel like a lot of college students know that. That's an okay feeling to have. I think they're trying to get out of that as fast as possible, which is hindering their learning. I didn't know that as a college student. I, that's a lesson I've learned very recently. Yeah. And then with the study materials the professor gives you, a lot of them will give you a study guide and just bulleting out notes for each one isn't going to be enough. So it depends on what class you're taking and what the exam format's going to be. It's kind of the same advice where if you're taking a practice exam, they always say like mimic test environment. So we'll go to, okay, it's quiet, no distractions. But a big part of that too is don't have your notes up next to you. Actually really try to work through a problem and you'll start to think like, okay, this is why my professor is asking me this and this is what they want me to to get out of it or this is the like the kinds of mistakes they want me to make because professors in college will try to make you make a mistake and there'll be an answer that's that mistake and so we feel really confident walking out of the test but yeah we're just like not paying attention to those small details so yeah when you're studying using a variety of different materials the study guides the practice exams the textbook the notes kind of synthesizing those all into one and then organizing all of that information. We talk a lot about a a condensed note page or like a one pager where it's like a cheat sheet that we don't get to use on the test, but going through that is a really good active way of figuring out what information you know and then putting it onto a page. That act of doing that is really helpful. Yeah, when you can take a lot of information that's big and make it small, that means you've done the work to learn it. So the number one piece of pushback you and I hear all the time is don't like the professor or I don't like the TA. What comes to mind when you hear that? It's life. You're not going to like everyone you work with and you need to figure out how to work together. So I know when they're maybe in a lecture and talking in front of 300 kids, they might not be likable, but that's not who they are as a person. A lot of these professors are really interesting and want to help students. So I would encourage you, even if it's, again, uncomfortable, go into their office hours and get to know them as a person. Introduce yourself so they know you as a person. In college, professors get a lot more laid back in my experience, which we don't expect them to. We expect them to be more rigid and more strict, but you just got to remember that they're humans. They want to help. So When a student's like, oh, I don't like my professor or TA, like I really challenge you just to get to know them as a person first and then go from there. I think it'll have a great benefit to how you learn from them, but also could be extra bonus points if it's the end of the year and they are rounding or not. Mm. And if they know you, it'll give you a great advantage. Yeah. The worst thing about professors and TAs is that they're human, right? Mm -hmm. And so... If you don't think you like them, it's even more important probably to go to office hours. Mm-hmm. Is it uncomfortable for a lot of students when they go? I think so. I think so because they don't know what to expect or what to say. I challenge them to have some questions ready or even if it's just like one question on the homework that they're confused about, just going in with that and then seeing where the conversation takes you from there. And A lot of the times too, I mean, it depends on the class, but some professors never get students in their office hours so they might be super excited that you're there and showing up for them yeah and i love the have one question ready because that decreases a lot of the anxiety i used to show up and be like hey and they'd be like why are you here yeah I'm like what do you need I'm, I'm, I'm just not doing well and so it never went anywhere but having that the question or two prepared is is, is a great idea mm-hmm. and it's usually more important to visit your professors for office hours even if you don't get along with them mm-hmm. it may not always work out and we all feel uncomfortable going into there. Like, that's okay. It's teaching mm-hmm. you how to have hard conversations. Mm-hmm. And we go, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. I just love hearing these big trends you see. Because if you're seeing it at this at many different universities, I'm sure so many other people are, are, are thinking mm-hmm. about this stuff as well. So yeah, thank absolutely. you so much. Thank you.